Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark, one of the Sigma Tech reps, uh, also commercial photographer at large. So the presentation that I'm doing for you tonight is actually kind of one of my favorites because regardless of what whatever knowledge that you have about photography, wherever you're at with, with your skill level, it's always great to remind yourself and go back to some of the basics and think about a couple of different things from um, basically starting from the beginning, more or less. So, um, and what I like to do here is that I, I talk about a lot of the things that sometimes you people understand or don't understand or they have misconceptions about, uh, but it's also a matter of thinking about what what lens do I want next or where should I go or do I want to go for a wide angle telephoto or prime? I keep hearing different things or uh, people suggest that I do this, that, or, or something different. And it's it's nice to have a little bit of insight to, to how the other lenses work and what they do and, and how things look for you. So um, that said, I'm gonna jump in and share my screen and I wanna make sure that everybody can see the screen. So Mike, if you could just chime in and make sure that it's up there and we're good to go. Um, you are good. We see your is. screen. Excellent, excellent. It's always it's always a challenge when everybody's muted. I'd like to make sure that everybody sees the screen and not get too far into it before it's not there. Okay, um, so basically what we're gonna talk about in the presentation, types of lenses, focal length, angle of view. And I, I say angle of view because that's an important piece of the puzzle to think about because depending on whether you're shooting a full frame camera or a crop sensor camera, a micro four thirds or four thirds, a point and shoot type camera, angle of view is important. Most of the time when you hear numbers, people talk about focal length in regards to how it looks if it was a 35 millimeter film lens uh, or 35 millimeter lens or a full frame focal length. So the, the key thing is like, if and I'll get into this a little bit more when, we, when I show you uh, one of the other slides, but if you think about the lenses that come with your, your, kit, uh, your kit camera or your kit lenses, I should say. So like if you have a crop sensor camera like a D90 or 90D or uh, the Z50 or um, a, a Sony 6300, 6400, those are APS-C size sensors. So the, the lenses that, that come with those cameras or that are designed for those cameras have a number on them. But what you have to do is actually take that number and add what they call a multiplier to it. And that gives you your full frame equivalent. So that'll make a little bit more sense as I jump into one of the other slides. Uh, fisheye lenses, there are two types of fisheyes. You've actually got a circular fisheye, which it looks like you're looking through the porthole. And then of course, uh, my favorite would be the rectangular fisheye that's actually giving you the full frame no no window around it and it's 180 degree field of view so uh they can be a lot of fun they can be a little niche um sometimes uh concert photographers overuse them a little too much but again it's a neat lens then you have a normal focal length um or um basically you're you're you know running gun kind of lens so like a a 24 to 70 thereabouts or 24 to, to um, 55 millimeters would be considered a normal focal length and then you have wide angle so then anything below 24 millimeters when, and up to and including 24 millimeters would be considered wide then you have uh, zoom lenses you have short zooms medium and long zooms um, something that I love to mention about all lenses is that every lens has something called a minimum focus distance. So if you get too close to a subject, you can't focus. And a lot of times people forget with a longer lens um, or even with a prime that you have to be a certain amount of distance away from something before you can actually focus on it. And that's where like if you're doing close up photography or macro photography, that's an important thing to know. Depth of field is something that really confuses a lot of people because you have depth of field and depth of focus. Uh, compression and how it applies to an image and um, talk about bokeh. So a lot of times people, most people think that you have to have a, you know, a fast aperture of 1.4, 1.8 or 1.2 to get that beautiful out of focus background. And that's the furthest thing from the truth because you can use a longer lens with a variable aperture and using the compression of the lens, get some nice smooth bokeh in your background. Uh, exposure triangle. So Another one of those tricks that 
you can use your aperture shutter and ISO to get to a certain point because sometimes you may not have a variable that you can work with. Stabilization, when, where, and how to use it. Uh, and motion blur is another thing that sometimes kind of gets people a little jammed up. So again, as I was starting to say before, you know, normal lenses. So from that 24 to 55 millimeters thereabouts would be considered a normal lens. 50 millimeters or the, the nifty 50 that, that used to be used in the film days, that's your normal eye view. Uh, that, that sees at an angle of 48.6 degrees. So that's if you covered one eye, you're looking out of a 50 millimeter lens from the one eye. So when you want your photography to stand out from something different uh, or make it more impressive, then you want to step away from that 50 millimeters. Uh, wide angle or fisheye, as I mentioned before, wide angles. Uh, there are wide angle lens that dip down into that fisheye territory of 14, 15, 16 millimeters. But when it's a, a, a quality wide angle lens, you have um, correction in there. So you're getting straighter lines or straight lines like the 14 millimeter or the 14 to 24 uh, in our lineup is highly corrected. So you'll see that bulb on the front of the lens. That's actually, that's not a fisheye. If it, uh, the fisheye, the bulb is actually on the inside of the glass. So when you see that big rounded dome on the front of the lens, that's a highly corrected wide angle lens. And that that's definitely something to think about if you're doing your astrophotography, architecture, uh, or even um, real estate and things like that. So when you're doing landscapes, you know, having a corrected lens like that will let you have straight trees as opposed to stuff starting to point in on you like that. And then, of course, you've got, like I said, zoom lenses or multi-purpose zooms or a telephoto. Um, why would you want both or do I want both? Do I want one or not want one at all? Um, in the old film days, you know, you weren't a professional unless you had prime lenses and there were no zooms. Zooms were taboo. In the last 10 years, that has changed so dramatically. Um, the, the glass, the lenses, the electronics, things have gotten so advanced that zoom lenses are every bit as good as primes. You just have to think a little bit differently. And a fast aperture uh, zoom lens gets very large and will cost you a lot of money because there's a lot of glass in there. So things to kind of think about, budget's always important. Uh, macro lenses, and again, one of my favorites, I'll even use macro lenses to do portraits and sports because they're a single focal length lens. You've got a dynamite close focusing distance on the lens and they're they're more more about shooting everything not just bugs and flowers and stamps and and doing super close up stuff so you know again another lens to add into the kit to give you something very different um, the neat thing about a macro lens if you're doing portrait work is that the the macros while you can go really close and hit one to one or life size reproduction you actually have the ability to hit infinity focus much faster than a standard still lens. So again, that's another way of using a, a lens in a different capacity to gain um, more or less depth of field and bokeh in your images. So I, was, I had mentioned before about sensor sizes. So here's a, a great representation of the typical sensors that are out there right now. So the one all the way down to the bottom is typically what you've got in most point and shoot cameras these days. Uh, there was actually a point where there was the sensor was an eighth inch sensor and that was the size of a pencil eraser. But typically you've got the four thirds, the APS-C. Uh, and if you notice, there are two different size APS-C sensors. So depending on what brand camera you're shooting, that multiplier can either be a 1.5 multiplier or a 1.6 multiplier. So if you take like, for argument's sake, the 18 to 35, you know, on a Nikon or a Sony, it's 18 times 1.5. On a Canon, it is, you know, 1.6. So you're somewhere between 23 and 25 millimeters as your uh, 35 millimeter focal length equivalent. And then of course you've got full frame, which is your 35 millimeter uh, sensor size or film equivalent, and it gives you a, a pretty good idea of the difference in sizes of the sensors. Now, bear in mind, uh, depending on the type of photography that you do, you know, megapixels are not all they're always cracked up to be. So if you're a, a night sky shooter, you want the bigger, bigger sensor with less megapixels, so your, your pixels are actually deeper, fatter, and uh, give you less noise 
So you're, you've got a much cleaner image when you're doing the night skies or, or high ISO shooting. Um, if you jam more pixels into a sensor, you know, you create more noise or digital grain, if you will. And something else to bear in mind, if you're thinking about this, to make an eight by 10 print. Now this is the mind bending part that most people forget or don't realize. You only need two megapixels of information clean, sharp information to make an eight by 10 print. So having 12, 18 or 24 megapixels, regardless of sensor size, that's more than enough to make a 40 by 60 inch print on a very regular basis. Having more megapixels, there are advantages to, to having that there. But again, you've got to remember that there are downsides just the same. So if you start shooting higher ISO ranges, you've got to be very mindful of what's acceptable as far as noise goes, and that will happen faster with higher pixel counts on the sensors. So great representation of the red, the red box is actually what you would see through your 70 to 200 on a full frame camera. And then if you threw that same 70 to 200 onto a crop sensor camera, that's the crop. That's what you're going to see because of the multiplier. So even though it's a full frame lens, you still have to add that multiplier in there. And this is where I was talking about before. People get very confused of like, if they take that 50 millimeter lens and they put it onto the full frame camera, it's, it's a nifty 50. But yet, if you put it onto an APS-C size camera, that 50 millimeter lens will give the appearance or the angle of view of an 85 millimeter lens or thereabouts. So you're gaining the multiplier and you're gaining the compression of what that, that lens does property-wise in a different environment. So here is a, a re, another real world example. So I took an 800 millimeter prime lens and mounted it onto a full frame camera and shot the rows across the yard. That's, that's the whole frame, that's 800 millimeters. Now, I took the camera off and added on a crop sensor camera. So now it's giving me the angle of view or the equivalent of what a 1200 millimeter lens would show me through the viewfinder. So if you're a, a, a nature photographer, a birder or aviation, or you're doing motorsports or stuff like that, using the crop sensor camera can actually have huge advantages with a full frame lens, especially a telephoto. So it's giving you much more range to play with and you're actually cropping in the camera and anywhere from 24 to, to 60 megapixels, more than enough firepower to make some huge prints. So here's the 50 millimeter lens, and this is gonna roll through um, a set of slides real fast for you, where it's going to just show you the, the focal length in the full frame and in the um, crop sensor format and how it changes. And just take notice of how you're compressing the image and how you're, you're pushing into it and then the background changes and it, it, it almost adds a slimming effect, if you will, to, to your photograph. And that becomes more apparent when you start doing portraiture and you'll see that uh, coming up as well. So this should keep going and it should go, actually go a little faster. But uh, again, as you see it, you know, 85, um, 185, 300 millimeters, 315 and then 500 millimeters, 500 millimeters, as opposed to 800 on a crop sensor. And it really pulls you in there. So one of the other things that on your lenses, if you've ever noticed, this is another neat thing uh, that most people ignore completely and, and don't pay attention to, but it actually has a lot of good information here. So it's, it's showing a scale. So you have some lenses that do, um, like the, the 18 to 300, or you have um, the 1770, which have macro capability. It's not a true macro lens, but yet it's giving you more magnification. And if you see the scales on there and the, um, the magnif magnification factors, depending on the zoom that you're at. So it's applying um, magnification. So you're approaching one-to-one, -one, but not quite getting there. And that would be the slide on the right. And again, while you're, you're almost broaching that one-to-one -one reproduction, you're not quite there. And then you've also got just on a regular still lens, you've got the feet and meter scale. So this is also on, on many of the, the macro lenses too. So if you're doing one-to-one -one reproduction, you don't really wanna use your autofocus on there. You actually wanna flip it to manual focus, set the scale where you see that one-to-one -one ratio. And then what you do is you're, you're gonna pull the camera in and out back and forth to gain focus on your subject. 
and that'll keep your camera at one-to-one. -one. If you put it into autofocus and you're a little further away than that one-to-one -one minimum focus distance, then you're going to end up getting something that's close but not quite one-to-one, -one. and you're, you're doing close-up photography, not macro at that point. But also, if you're looking to say, all right, I want to use this 30-millimeter lens and I need to do a product shot, but I don't want to be four feet away. I want to be as close as I can to get the most of the product in the frame. So you're at, at you know, the foot-wise, you're at 0.4 feet or 0.98 feet or 0.3 meters to be your minimum focus distance on your subject. And sometimes lenses won't have a scale on there, but you may want to read through the notation or the tech spec on the lens because it tells you that there is a minimum focus distance. Like the old advanced kit lens of 70 to 300. I had a four foot minimum focus distance and people couldn't understand why when they got under four feet, why their images were blurry. Well, you were just too close. You had to back up just a little bit to give you that little push. Then you have a series of switches on the other lens. So you have your AF, MF. Then the bottom, the next one down is Mike and I love to talk about this one because we, we while we have very similar views, we have different views at the same time on it. This is called a limit switch. Um, if you're very mindful, using the limit switch can be very helpful as long as you know distances from your subject. So the first position is minimum focus distance to um, 10 meters. And then you have 10 meters to infinity. So if you're doing you know, a soccer game and you know that you're in the goal or behind the goal and you, and you just want to be within you know, 20 yards of, of where you're shooting, you don't care about anything, you know, after that. Then you go to the, the beginning and you do minimum focus distance to 10 meters. Same thing is that if you're watching a play in the middle of a field and you know that you're looking between a 20 or 25 yard gap, then the 10 meters to infinity could be what you really want to mess around with because this way you know what your range is. Personally, for most shooters, I, I tell everybody, leave it on full because the motors and the lenses are fast enough these days that you can actually get back and forth from minimum focus to infinity and back before you can even blink an eye. So, you know, in days gone by, I would say limit switch is imperative. Today, uh, the focus motors can kind of take up for that. Um, the, the next switch down is actually a, a stabilization. So it's OSVRIS, stabilization, period. Uh, some cameras allow you to do stabilization in camera as well as in the in the lens. Um, some cases you may have to turn one or the other off. Uh, the new Canon mirrorless cameras, by the way, you can double dip. And when you have a, a five axis stabilization in the R5 and the R6, <clears throat> and then you add in, you know, what we have here, you've got upwards of between eight and nine stops of stabilization handheld, which would be position one. So that's up, down, side to side movement of your camera. Position two is actually for if you're mounted and panning a subject. So if you're chasing you know, the kids down the field, you would be on a monopod or a tripod and you're watching the action go past you. So you're stabilizing one axis and then you can um, basically just keep one axis, knows that it's moving back and forth. So it's helping you steady that out. Um, depending on shutter speeds. Now here, and again, the million dollar question is, do I use it? Do I not use it? When do I use it? Um, Stabilization is all about camera movement under normal handheld shutter speeds. So if you're, say you're shooting a 100 millimeter lens, theoretically, you're supposed to turn the stabilizer on when you start dipping below 100 of a, uh, one hundredth of a second or a 60th of a second. Most people could still handhold that pretty steady. Uh, if, you know, and you'll have to experiment where your thresholds are. I have customers who can handhold to a 20th of a second. I'm not one of those people. I like my caffeine. I will never be a surgeon. So for me, I need the stabilizer if I'm getting that low or I get to a point where I've got to put it onto a tripod and let the tripod or monopod help me out and, and keep it steady. Um, even on a tripod, if you're shooting landscapes and you've got heavy winds, there's going to be vibration on the camera. So you may want to turn that back on and get some kind of stabilization going in there. But again, if you're shooting in a condition and you, you suddenly come up with a soft image with the stabilizer on, turn the stabilizer off. You may be overstabilizing the camera. The stabilizer can and will introduce shake into your image.
because it's looking for movement that's not there and it almost jitters it like it has Parkinson's. So there is a chance that it could actually throw a little bit of vibration in there. And then the custom switch, I'll leave that for much later. So if anybody who has a Sigma lens and wants to ask about that, Mike and I can talk about that a little later on. Um, aperture scale. So going from F2.8 up to F22. And if you notice that the, the way that, the, that this whole thing works is, I mean, it's the iris of the lens. It's how much light is being let in. So F2.8 lets tremendous amounts of light into your lens and also um, shallow depth of field. So as you go the other direction, stopping down to F22 or closing the aperture to F22, you're, you're letting less light into the lens and you're getting more depth of field. Now, there is a converse side to this. So more light means faster shutter speeds. Less light means slower shutter speeds. So depending on what you're shooting and doing, you may need to have some kind of help to hold the camera steady so you can shoot at a deeper depth of field to give you more of that. Um, and again, playing around with ISO and um, shutter speeds you, and, and aperture, you can achieve the same goal doing a lot of different things. So again, just keep, that's something to keep in mind is that your, your shutter speed and your aperture really, they move in opposite directions. So as you open the shutter, I, I'm, I'm sorry, as you open the aperture, the shutter speed goes up. As you close it down, the shutter speed goes down. So um, you, there's a, there is a fine line that you have to draw in there and play that game. So here's an example of 105 millimeters at F 1.4. And shooting it at one eighth of a second, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, at f1.8 rather, I apologize, at f1.8 at an 80th of a second, ISO 450, I'm using constant lights. So my light source isn't changing, but I can play around with some other variables and actually achieve the same results. But when I use, when I stop down to f16, notice how my ISO to stay at the same shutter speed jumps up to ISO 12,000. But if I go back, oh, so now if you look at the shallow depth of field here, I've got um, the father and son Templar Knights. The father's side of his face is nice and sharp, which is what I wanted. But then on the, the next frame, I wanted the, the son to be just as in focus as the dad. And boom, there you go. It jump, you jump in and with a deeper depth of field, foreground to background is in, in focus by using your uh, your aperture playing the same game a couple of different ways so you know playing with your, your depth of field can have a lot of different effects and feel to your images too so uh changing your focus point so focus point on the front of the gun you know gives you a very surreal look like you're looking down the barrel of the gun otherwise you want to see the look in, in the scowl in, in the cosplayer's eyes so focus became on his eyes Here's a great, great, great teaching tool that I love to use and, and show people. Um, if you really want to get into depth of field and how it changes with your specific combination, uh, this is an online depth of field calculator that you can also put onto your telephones uh, or your cell phones, I should say, or your computer. And you can put in your camera, the focal length lens, the f-stop that you want, the distance, and calculate exactly what your true depth of field is your, your near limit, far limit, um, what's going to be in focus in front or behind the subject. And that's where your depth of focus comes into play. Because again, when people talk about calibration, they're shooting a 1.4 or 1.8 lens, like the 35 millimeter or the 85 millimeter. Oh, my images are so soft. Well, depending on your distance, you may actually have the proper depth of field of what you're shooting. It's just such a narrow depth of field, especially as you get closer to your subject, um, that you just may need to stop down some. So some people like like to think that, well, I'm gonna do a portrait at F1.4. You don't necessarily wanna do that because that that's a recipe for disaster. You can have one eye in focus and one eye out of focus because you have such a narrow depth of field. So again, this is an online uh, calculator called Depth of Field Master. So depthoffieldmaster.com is where you can find this. And there's, tons of great information and it breaks it down goes back and forth back and forth of all of the, the pertinent information pictorial descriptions and you could pop in the same lens but change 
to a crop sensor camera and you can see how that changes. Now, a lot of times people also think that, well, if I put that 50 millimeter lens onto my crop camera with the fast aperture, the aperture is going to change. No, the aperture is not going to change. What's going to change is the amount of compression that you're applying to the image. So aperture is aperture and, and that stays constant. So you're gaining a little bit of compression on the image, but your and your depth of field will change a little bit because again of that compression. So again, this is where this becomes a very helpful tool to you. Um, wide angle lenses, you know, great to have in the bag. So now you need to decide, do I want a regular wide angle or a super wide angle, depending on where I'm headed or what I'm doing. I wanna do landscapes. So a lot of times, you know, 24 millimeters is good for most people, but then they say, well, I also wanna do night sky. Then you're going to more, more wide angle because you wanna see more of the night sky. So, you know, you, you go down to that 14 millimeters or 14 to 24, 14 to 28. Um, that would be another focal length to think about and use. Uh, again, depending on, on how wide you wanna go, if you're doing real estate photography, you want to get as wide as you can and keep everything straight so the 14 to 24 would be the tool of choice and um again you're spreading everything out and wide angle lenses also tend to have more inherent depth of field just because of what they are which is kind of neat so even if you're shooting in a shallower depth of field on the wide angle lens it still gives you a little bit more depth of field than um the telephoto would because of uh, it's not compressing the image it's spreading it out Telephoto lenses, you know, again, great for isolating your subject and pushing out the background. Now, the image on the bottom of the screen there, that is actually out in the uh, Nevada desert or mountains, I should say. And that was shot with a 150 to 600 sport at roughly 580 millimeters. Um, the fun part about it was to get the composition that I have there, I kept running down the road, looking through the viewfinder and then getting you know running down the road a little further running a little further and then laid down in the road shooting back at the truck um i, I love trucks i love the way that the clouds and the light made everything look so painterly or around the scene uh and you don't really see too many fully restored willie's jeeps out in the desert or anywhere to be honest so it was a, a beautiful truck nicely done and i just love the the scene that it was in so here i'm the lunatic laying down in the road praying I don't get run over by one of the townies in this tiny little mountain town and shot back at the truck to, to make a beautiful image that you would have thought I stood in front of it with a wide angle lens to do. And I got the compression in the soft background by shooting at, um, I believe I was at like F8 and got a, a nice compression on the image and it made the foreground pop a little bit. So I've got my separation and it allowed me to do what I wanted to do there. Now, I also personally like to use longer telephoto lenses to do portrait work because of the amount of compression that it adds. So, and that's something that we can get into again a little bit later. So showing you exactly how angle of view and compression change a scene just by using a longer lens. So uh, this was done with like an 18 to 200 millimeter lens. And um, so at full wide angle, you know, this is what, the three vases look like up on the fence. Now, just zooming in a little bit to 50 millimeters, it looks like I've changed angle and changed where I was, and I haven't. It just adds more compression, narrows down the field, so you're looking at less image. And again, going up to the 200 millimeter mark, it looks like, wow, okay, you completely changed, went to a totally different lens, and you're in another position. No, I haven't moved. It's just the way that the compression of the lens and what it does here, and even with, again, that variable aperture lens, look at the background. It's, you know, beautiful bokeh out of, out of focus area. So in portrait work, you know, this is one of the reasons why you would not use a wide angle lens to take a portrait. Young lady uh, and her daughter, and if you look at her leg closest to the camera, it looks like a tree trunk, very unflattering. And that's because, again, the wide angle lens is spreading everything out and giving you kind of a distorted view of what you see. Plus the fact that how many times have you taken one of these pictures where you know that you've got this beautiful blue sky. And for those of you that are out on the West Coast, you've always got beautiful blue skies um, for the most part. Um, well, I, I should say, 
until you know early morning till about 9 30 or so you've got gray sky and then all of a sudden that marine, marine layer lifts and boom beautiful blue sky but again this is supposed to be a blue sky non-existent because between the black in the foreground and what they're wearing and the shadows that we're trying to, to balance is blowing out the sky and it's just a very unflattering photograph all the way around so by changing your focal length going to a 50 millimeter lens we eliminate some of that distracting background notice how her leg suddenly slimmed out and the shadows opened a little bit because again now we're looking at a more concentrated section of the frame and the, the camera the meter in the camera even though it's set to look at all of the information it's opening the shadows because the amount of black and the dark colors on the uh, the dress again going back to that that longer lens that longer telephoto length um look at the length look at her leg it normal beautiful skinny leg she's she's happy about that and you've got two beautiful smiles you've gotten rid of all of the background that was distracting you've got a little bit of softness behind them the subject pops and you've got concentration on your subject in the middle of the frame which is kind of what you really want so um and then again like i was saying before about versatility you know of using a lens beyond what it's meant to do so uh, as i explained about the landscape shot with the truck uh, doing that with a long telephoto but i could also do the portraits with a long telephoto too uh, macro lens i love 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 doing portrait work with macro lenses because of the amount of detail that jumps out of the photograph even at, an, at a wide open f-stop because of what the lens is it's a flat field lens so it, it's achieving that infinity focus faster and it's it's giving you more detail without working any harder but that's what it's designed to do is give you as much detail as possible so uh like here um i've got tons of detail on that dress and you can see all the intricate uh stitching on the lace because it's you know because of it being a macro lens yet i don't have to shoot at f56 or f8 this is actually shot at i think of f3.2 and i've got plenty of depth of field from the front of her face to the back of her head and i'm not working all that far away from her so i'm able to do that you know head and shoulder shot basically and do um a headshot right right there on the spot with the macro lens now we were talking or i mentioned you've heard me mention bokeh Boca, 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 Boca. So Boca is your out of focus area in your frame. And what makes one lens different than another lens is kind of an important piece is the amount of aperture blades in the diaphragm in your lens. So the more blades that you have, and also if the blades are rounded as something that we do as a company, all of the aperture blades, there are 11 blades, nine or 11 blades in the lenses, and they're all rounded. So that gives a more specular of a prettier specular highlight in the out of focus areas so typical uh or less expensive lenses i should say uh, that have less aperture blades you get more of a, a hexagonal kind of a specular highlight and it doesn't become as creamy as pretty with the rounded aperture blade and um, more blades giving you a, a more perfect circle your out of focus areas become more creamy and more smooth so you get better gradation of color and transition into to softness if you will a um, couple of lenses that I, I love to as go-to's you know talking about different focal lengths and and what they're appropriate for so the new york city halloween parade is, is something that i try to do as often as i can my go-to for doing all the portrait work up and down the, the parade route is the 24105 f4 is perfect i can shoot it wide open because i it is at night in this particular frame i did pop a flash because i wanted more detail of the makeup that she had on and i love also the orange glow behind where the flash is not hitting so i've actually got the flash concentrated more into a um, a tighter area so I'm, I'm getting just her but i love the the orange glow of the street lamps on her friends behind her and they couldn't believe by the way that i pulled her into the parade route from as a bystander just to photograph her they, they were like you know why her but because I, again i like the makeup um here's the shocker look at the exif information on the bottom of the slide now again using a really long telephoto lens to do portrait and portfolio work so um Aaliyah wanted 
some some work some new stuff for her portfolio she was looking to work with a couple of different agencies and uh, this was a gazebo out behind one of the local hotels that i asked for permission to go and use because they had some nice wooded area behind them and middle of the day it's quiet there's nobody at the hotel so they're like yeah go ahead have fun and we went out to the gazebo so just ambient light under the gazebo um got back shot around 380 to 400 millimeters so i was about a good 35 40 feet away from her and because of the the compression on the lens i'm able to shoot an f6 3 and get beautiful out of focus background but tons of detail to show the gorgeous eyes the glasses the dress um plenty of detail on her so i've got great depth of field on her i've got plenty of information and she pops right off the page because of the combination that i've got going on there and again bringing it into the full uh 600 millimeters um i wanted to see the eyes i you know because again uh, as a portrait person that to me eyes are everything so i love the fact that i've got the detail in the reflections you can see the rest of the gazebo the believe it or not the back of the hotel um and just the fact that she's got close to flawless skin which is unusual for a model um even to the paint um the, from the stain that someone splashed on the pole on the white pole for the gazebo so but again look at the background it is completely out of focus at f63 again 120 to 300 is one of my great um lenses for for sports but i also do portraits with it because again uh, long lens compression wedding event photographers um, go crazy over this this is the lens that i like to use when i'm shooting uh, concert work and I, I do my three and out from the front of the stage and then i have to move back to the soundboard so when, you, when you're shooting a professional show you can't stay up in the front of the stage for the entire show so you you get if you're lucky you get three songs and then you get booted out to, to either out of the show completely or if you're lucky enough and you know people there you can actually go back to the soundboard and shoot from back there but you need the longer lens and it's a faster aperture lens so it allows me to to work in some of the less um quality lighting systems that they have in some of the venues and you know again how versatile where where am i going what am i doing so a normal zoom lens 24 70 24 105 um you know you've got your all-in-one lenses 18 to 300 uh, can do stuff like this you know ultra wide angle lenses so when you have um you know a, a big area that you want to cover you know i'm out in new mexico for in the uh, the vla so you know it, it's such a massive area but when you get out there and you and you see these radar dishes and you know just you want all of them in the photograph at one time so uh we were lucky we had a like a half moon so we got some nice illumination on the dishes so it looks like um, i've got the midday light hanging there but it is 10 o'clock at night and using a an ultra wide angle lens and i'm somewhere around 20 millimeters i'm able to get the entire array on there and you know these things are massive and they're on they're actually on train tracks and they move these things around so it just happens that the night that i was there the way they had them lined up you, know, you had a line of them going straight back and then you had the the background where they were straight across the screen and it allows you to kind of keep things all in perspective there back to my favorite 24 105 for portrait work so here I, again this is straight ambient light at iso 3200 um just the street lamps and good Again, good white balance, knowing knowing the temperature of uh, the lights that I'm, I'm working around. So uh, the other thing that you could do too is that there's something called a color checker passport. If you're unclear about color temperatures or uh, lighting conditions, you, you could take a frame right in the beginning as a reference. And then when you bring that into your editing process, um, you can actually utilize that to, to clean up and neutralize all of your white balance to an even baseline, which is kind of neat. Um, Definitely ask the people in the store to show you one of these things. It's actually made by a company called x -Rite, and it folds up into a little credit card thing that you slip in your pocket. So it's a very powerful tool, and it doesn't cost a lot of money, but it saves you a lot of time in post-production, by the way. So 
you know, basically it's the street lamps and the LEDs that are lighting up this image for me. And we were talking about shutter speeds, um, you know, freezing, freezing action and doing stuff. So, you know, again, telephotos, you know, where, where, when, and how, by the way, uh, I was working, doing some magazine work and the top left shot is actually, I'm out on the tarmac as they're pulling out to take off. So I'm shooting a 24 105 there and I'm pretty much about 30 feet away from him as he's getting ready to take off. But for me, it's all about, you know, the pilots in the planes and it was, I love the reflection in his visor and, um, you know, the fact that I was able to be there and that close. Uh, we talked about shutter speeds and a little bit and, you know, on like a prop plane, you want to be able to slower shutter speed to get that full disc blur. And part of the secret that many people forget about, by the way, with something like that is direction of light. So uh, here, now that the information on the bottom, by the way, is completely wrong. Um, and that's why I'm actually talking to what's in the images right now. So you've got the, the top left is a 24105. The um, bottom right is actually a, a 120 to 300 shot. And then the other two images are actually 150 to 600 contemporary lenses. And these are all being shot off of uh, Nikon D3S and Z6, by the way. So, you know, if the light is hitting the prop in the right direction and you have a slow enough shutter speed, yes, you can get the full disc blur. But you also, like on a prop plane, by the way, if you're shooting stuff like that, you want to slow down just enough so you can get some blur on the prop so it doesn't look like you ran out of gas in the air. And by dragging your shutter or slower shutter speeds and panning with your subject like the bottom left you can actually shoot at the slower shutter speed and still show motion so you're locking focus on the target and panning with your subject so you're keeping the same speed as he's passing you so the plane stays in focus but the smoke or the exhaust coming out of there gives you the streaming effect and you know that's denoting speed as it comes buzzing past you um and then, of course, you've got, I love the way that, you know, these guys came back down into formation and as they were coming, compressed it for a head-on shot. So uh, the light wasn't optimal, but it's still, you got a little bit of a blur on the props, but I love the repeating patterns. I love the, the swirl of the smoke and the way it actually kind of leads you, the, the smoke leads you right into the planes itself. So you've got some nice leading lines there, but this is where telephoto lenses and playing around with shutter speeds can actually help you. Shooting into reflections can be kind of tricky and fun at the same time. So this is, by the way, going back to the exposure triangle. So if, you, if, you, if you're taking notes, um, depending on the type of lens that you're playing with, this is one of the fun things that you can experiment with. Draw a triangle on your, on your paper and put ISO on one point, uh, shutter speed on another point, and aperture on the third point. So... On a triangle, no matter what you do to that triangle, all three angles will always equal 180 degrees, right? Okay, so photography kind of, kind of works out to be the same thing because as long as you have some variables to work with, you can get to the same point by making an adjustment to one or all three of those variables and doing something a little different. So if you don't have a super fast lens and you need to, to get a slightly different exposure, you can adjust your ISO and your shutter speed to compensate for where you have your lack of um, aperture control. So even still, bumping ISO, especially on the newer cameras, not a big deal. In some cases, you can clean things up pretty nice in post-production. So again, not a big deal. But again, utilizing one of the one of the one or all three of those variables, you can actually get to the same point and make some adjustments to correct for different situations. So um, it's another tool in the toolbox that you, you have that you can make adjustments and try different things based on conditions. And if you get totally jammed up and you never know what to do or you're just frustrated because the images aren't looking like you want them to in manual aperture or shutter priority, key thing to do here, throw the camera into program or that P mode, which stands for professional mode, and take a quick snapshot. 
It's basically a digital Polaroid and it allows the camera to say, okay, here's your best exposure with what you got going on. And it'll, it'll make all of those adjustments and it gives you a good jumping off point. So now you can look at the, the playback information to say, oh, this is what the camera did. All right, I want to affect you know, the background or the foreground or the color a little bit. So I'm going to make this adjustment and that adjustment. So if you have the latitude to make those adjustments, you can get to that point and actually get the image that you want. If you're in a situation where you don't have time to think about it you're, and you're just, you're, you're just, there's too much going on, throw it in program, shoot, have fun, get the shot. That's the key thing to think about here. Um, so again, going back to what I've got here is I had a giant mirror that this model was doing her makeup in and the only thing that's actually lighting the situation because we're in a dark studio is the ambient daylight which you could see that the light was not shining in the window you know just enough to brush the side of the building it's basically the lights on her mirror are actually lighting everything up so she's got these these bulbs for the makeup mirror and she's got this like four foot by four foot mirror that she's sitting in front of and i'm shooting behind her off to the side and shooting her reflection. So it's got a, I, I like, again, the playing into the reflection itself. The key to getting sharp reflection images is don't focus inside the reflection. Don't focus on the subject in there. You know, habit means, you know, I want to focus on the eye inside that reflection, but it's going to give you a false focus or a false positive as far as what the camera is looking at. And it's going to end up being soft. Focus on the edge of the frame of where the mirror meets the frame of whatever's holding it or the wall. Um, and then hold that focus and then recompose slightly because that will give you your perfect focus. So again, I wanted her, the real girl, to be out of focus because I wanted to make it look like you had two people standing in front of each other. Again, 1424 shooting outside of my office for a given afternoon. Um, as you can see by the side of his helmet, we're at 21,000 feet, and um, while I can't really shove him over and move him because he's too close to me, um, the stunt pilot that was pulling up next to us was actually more of the focus of what I wanted. And um, even in F4.5, I had tremendous depth of field because of solid, clean sky, um, very little moisture in the air, and basic proximity to everything that I wanted. So this is what a wide angle can do for you. So by the way, I am probably about nine to 10 inches off of his helmet. I'm sitting at the edge of the open door with two harnesses on. Uh, and yes, again, we're at 21,000 feet. So basically what's happening in this image, by the way, is that the stunt plane pulls up next to the uh, paratroopers. And these are the guys that jump out with the American flag to open up the air show. So as they come down with the American flag, um, and the POW flag, the stunt pilot actually starts uh, shooting red, white, and blue smoke and does rings around them. So um, just a typical day in the office. Thinking outside the box, going back to using a long lens, let's, let's do a portrait with a 100 to 400. Um, I stuck my model right into the edge of an alleyway. So I had the sunlight just brushing the top of her cap and I played around with my exposure until I got what I wanted. So again, come in using, using the telephoto to compress it a little bit so the background becomes less descript. And I was able to keep a nice even exposure um, and get exactly what I wanted, which was the gorgeous, gorgeous eyes with just a little hint of light from under the brim, brim of the cap. So prime lenses and fish eyes. Well, a fish eye actually is a prime because it is a single focal length, but again, um, the, the shot on the right is the 15 millimeter fisheye. Uh, the neat thing about this particular lens is that you've got like a minimum focus distance of about three inches off the front element. The lens hits infinity focus, I think somewhere is around 10 inches. So wide open at F2.8 on this particular lens. Uh, Victor is an interesting character. Um, I don't necessarily share his political views one way or the other, but I like the tattoo, I like the rings and the fact that he's just a character. So as he's throwing up the horns for me, I got a great shot of him with the performer up on stage, trying to figure out what we're doing and talking about us while he's up on stage. And just got a cool shot of Victor hanging out. Um, using the um, 14 millimeter, actually, if you've never been to Coney Island before, if you ever make it to New York, it's a must. Um, 
the the wonder wheel is you know one of the bigger attractions in coney island it's it's um it's a beautiful restored um ferris wheel and that ramp believe it or not is actually on about a 15 degree grade but i laid down on the concrete and actually angled my camera back up at the ferris wheel and um if you notice the people in the foreground going into the tunnel under underneath the ferris wheel they actually stepped over me and kept walking so uh interesting you know new york it, it, it's it was beautiful they didn't even think that i was face down on the ground or whatever they just stepped over me kept walking i waited till they got far, far enough down the lane and then shot a great shot um down the ramp of the wonder wheel itself so a, a bigger shot of victor uh wide wide angle at 24 millimeters night sky uh, again this is what you can do utilizing that long lens wide open so sometimes uh you know the fans are actually more exciting than the game so again just taking advantage of um you know the william wallace wannabe here and uh getting a great shot of a fan watching a losing game getting a little creative with some street photography and a, and, a, and a prime so the neat thing by the way is that the red in the background is from a street light that turned red so I waited for the lights to change and you know the the amber the red and the green had a, a completely different effect so the, the red looked the best um, I was maybe a foot in front of the motorcycle I angled myself correctly so it doesn't look like you actually have a super wide angle lens and you're able to do street photography Um, as I mentioned before about shooting and using the ISO to, to slow things down or speed things up, fast shutter speeds to stop your action, slow it down if you want to drag the shutter a little bit. And like I said, just a couple of different shots here as we should be coming up towards the end. By the way, and again, by dragging the shutter a little bit, you can also show motion like i said before so again drop the shutter speed tag sharp on the truck um kicking up the dirt going to town sometimes actually going faster is more important so you're st slowing down the uh you're actually capturing the, the the action and stopping the spokes but um in this case it, it works for me same thing here and again here's your full disc um shooting you know at f63 at a 400th of a second not dragging the shutter because again i've got enough of everything going on especially with him flying right next to me well there was a lot of information that i threw at you folks so now comes the best part the questions the comments and sarcastic remarks um what i will remind everybody is that yes please come into the store I will be there all day on Friday and I will be there on Saturday for the photo walk and then back in the store after the photo walk. So you can definitely come in the store and harass me all day long. <laughs> that, that was great, Mark. Uh, there was a couple questions in the chat. Uh, one I missed earlier, I didn't want to interrupt was, do you remember which lens that Halloween photo was with the uh, bright blue eyes on the, that you grabbed the, the person. Oh, the, uh, yeah, no, that's a 24105. 24105 F4. And it was great because some of the other uh, participants were helping to answer other participants' questions. So I was loving seeing the community in here. Right now we're getting um, a question from Mike. Uh, can you explain how to use the custom buttons on the lens? And uh, I'm not sure which part he was referring to, but go ahead. All I think right. you can so, get the custom one and two features probably. So <clears throat> the custom one and two feature is you, well, first of all, you need a USB dock. That would be part one. Part two is you need to download the free software from our website so you can actually go in and utilize the opportunity to first do firmware updates if there's any available for the particular lens that you're going there for. And then the customization part on the longer lenses, you actually have the ability to change how stabilization appears in the viewfinder. You can create those custom limit switches, like I said, if you want, or you can actually overclock or underclock your focus motors depending on what you're doing. So um, advantage to making the focus motor faster is that obviously it will acquire focus faster, but the, the uh, downside, you've got to be a lot more pinpoint precise on your point of contrast 
because think of a, a plus sign. So as you go faster, the plus sign gets thinner. As you go slower, the plus sign gets fatter. So it has more meat to grab. Now, the if you slow it down for the more accurate selection in there, um, it's supposed to slow the focus down. Sometimes I don't think it does. I think it actually stays just as fast. It just gives you more traction. So you'll have to experiment with your, you know, your given subject matter and your camera. But um, you know, that's how you would use the customization. And generally what personally I do is I, again, I, I keep it simple. Button one for speed. I want to be first. Easy way to remember it. Button two, slow and steady. You know, you know, low and slow. Uh, just I'm there and it works. So birds in flight, button one. Birds nesting, button two. It, it's it's the easiest way for me personally to remember. So this way, if I do customize it, I can set it for two different ways. And then off is out of box performance. Everything is just like you bought it brand new. That's a great explanation. And uh, we're getting a shout out from the Port Jefferson Photo Club in Long Island, New York. So they're definitely giving you the shout out. Uh, we're getting one question. Also, I don't know if it's totally related to this, but maybe you have some advice on this. You have any tips on how to build backdrops for portraits or headshots with different materials? Or is this um, you ever well, with? your backdrops for portraits should be pretty simple. Don't make it too extravagant um, because your person in the portrait is more important than the background. Um, if you know if you're strapped and you and you you've got a pretty surroundings like a park or something like that uh take them out to the park you know watch for the direction of light or use a reflector to kind of bounce some light in there and then have them far enough away from the background and with no distractions so you can actually utilize the foliage or the, the buildings or something else like that as an interesting background um you want to contrast your subject so uh, you know uh, it, it's real simple you can go into home depot and lowe's and buy a, a big giant white canvas um you know drop cloth and shoot a colored light or two colored lights at the background but again something contrasting and, and keeping it different giving you a little bit of separation between your, your subject and your, your background um keep it simple that's the best thing don't distract from the the subject I like yeah that. and overall everyone has said nothing but uh praise for this presentation thank you for the refresher and it was very thorough on the sensors and we have shared the link on your visit to Sammy's, which will be November 5th and November 6th. So people have been checking that out. And other than that, I think we're going to, we're just at time. So I want to thank everyone for coming and Sammy's, uh, we're going to end this for Sammy's. So we're going to end the meeting, but uh, thank you for everyone who's coming out. We're doing deals all through October, November. So please come and support Sammy's and we'll be doing more of these as for the next coming months.